Gus, you know, I sometimes give you the opportunity and you drop the ball. That'll be a whole different conversation. But why don't you start the podcast this week? I don't even want to have that other conversation is the thing. We will um, have it, and it will that's... maybe be during the episode in front of our guests. But can you please just intro the podcast? Oh, my schedule's full, so we'll try to see if it's happening. Anyway, we'll guys, welcome back to the Gus and Eddie podcast. Uh, it is a good podcast. Shut the fuck up. Uh, uh, today our guests are Mike and Jackson of the Trophy Husbands! Hey! Welcome, boys! Hey, guys. Oh, thank you so much for having us. It's a dream. Of course. We wanted to have you on the podcast because you're our boys and you're our friends. Dude, the boys love boys. You know that. It's You know, oh, it's yes. the philosophy for it. One thing I still... I want to mention immediately because I watched the entire thing yesterday. Um, uh, well, guys, why don't you explain first, especially the timing of what you've made very recently? Yeah, yes, we can do that. We can we do, can do it. That. We'll do it right now on three on three. No, uh, we had just released our first kind of uh, TV show docu series, if you will. It's an eight episode uh, documentary that follows the disappearance of my great great uncle, Harold Heaven. And it's a mix of comedy and true crime. And the way we kind of do that is we, uh, we're basically two comedians in Toronto. And uh, this case has been cold for 87 years. So we have to use different tactics and get a little weird with it. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we're super proud of it. And Eddie, thank you for watching it. Gus, yeah. I know you will never watch it. I refuse <laughs> no, to watch it. Eddie's like, watch this. And I said, I, would, you, I couldn't be fucked to watch this damn thing. <laughs> And if any of you listening would like to watch it, it's called For Heaven's Sake. I missed that part. It's available uh, on Paramount Plus right now. Uh, eight episodes. It came out about a month ago. It's been awesome. And like Mike said, we spent a lot of time making it, a lot of time sort of figuring out the tone of how to tell a true crime as comedians. So if you like true crime, if you like comedy, if you just like the boys, you're going to love it. Check it out. I, I, and for our Canadian fans, sorry, Eddie, I cut you off. For okay. our Canadian fans, uh, it's on CBC Jam. Uh, in Canada, which is yeah, they'll get that, they'll love that. They'll when they hear that, they'll be like, VPN "Of course it is." I'm a Canada guy. Saving, <laughs> I was saving most of my words for it uh, for the podcast because I don't, or I think um, in because we we met at Buffer Fest 2019, correct? 18, 2018. 18, I want to say. Oh yeah, because yeah. there's there was one right after that, and then yeah. So I remember uh, Mike, you mentioning at 2019 that you guys were going to go and do the show. And I was like, oh, I'm excited to see it. But like the part of my head was like, oh, how the hell do you turn such a cold case like into a true crime series that's super entertaining? And you guys did it so well. How the fuck uh -oh. did you take a case that is like in a small town where there's not really a lot of evidence and you made uh, like after I got to the end of the first episode and I was like, I'm so gripped by this. And like you guys really turned like Kind of nothing because it's such a cold case in this really something. I, re I really love the show. I think ev everyone should go watch it. And um, I already really love these two boys. So uh, I really hope you guys go support them for real. I Dude, love thank you so very, much. very much. That's very kind of you. Uh, yeah, but it gets I'm kind of known question. as the kind one of the group. <laughs> <laughs> Good cop, bad cop is your absolutely your thing. I get it. People like to call we'll guys the over diva. Um, uh, the, diva queen. the diva cop. The disco nice. to the cop is what they call. call nice. Me. Just wanted to clarify for the record. His so. methods are unconventional, <laughs> and he does, but he does not even solve the crimes. He's just a bad cop. <laughs> but it he cashes there. that paycheck and goes home to his wife, and it's a happy guy. There I get go. it. <laughs> I'm just uh, so happy even to see. Uh, just I feel like it was a very weird experience for me to see like friends have such a legitimate production you know like it started up and i was just like oh holy shit those are the guys i know but it's a tv show that's fucking insane dude it is insane it's i get that a lot too of just people being like they won't say anything about me or michael let's be like this looks professional and like, yeah. yeah dude well, that's because it is one of my favorite things about the beginning of the show and i don't want to talk like too much about you know anything that happens in the show because it's more it's a mystery that i want people to watch is right off the very beginning uh, Mike's family to both of you are like, I don't think you guys are capable of solving anything with this. I don't think you're going to get anything done. And it was just like really <laughs> surprised and thought it was hilarious how honest they were, where they're like, yeah, I don't, 
really know what you guys are doing here, but I don't think that there's going to be a lot of progress. Yeah, which is totally fair. I mean, it's like you said, it's an 87-year-old cold case. So they uh, they were more than kind in, to us, um, and they were honest with us the whole way, but they wanted to solve the case just as much as us. So that was like what allowed us to you know make the strides we made, was having access to the family and having them on board. As skeptical as they may be, they did give us give it their all, and whenever we needed anything from them, they were more than happy to help out. And to, and to your point, Eddie, uh... They, they had the same mindset. They're like, oh, you boys are going to play detective. You're going to get silly. We get it. Uh, and then we showed up with like a 12, 13 person crew. And like my anxiety was a, a full tilt because uh, just everyone, we kind of like stormed their house and mm. had to like move furniture and make the, the interview setup look good. And man, they were like, oh, this is this is pretty way more uh, professional than I thought it was going to be. And then, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a lot of trust involved. Well, also, even um, without, you know, again, because, like, I want uh, people to go watch it. So it's like I just want to ask of the, the process of filming that type of show because you guys did it in a very small town in Ontario. Right. And it was uh, like, did you guys stay there completely for like a long period of time? Like, did you just go live there for a while? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we had a full crew with us, like a 10 person crew. And so we rented out like a local inn up there and they you know were nice to us and let us stay as long as we wanted and uh it was pretty awesome especially for me as someone from toronto not from the city to you know or not from the country rather to get immersed and like meet everybody and sort of just get welcomed because the town was you know i think a little like mike's family skeptical at first but we won them over eventually and that was a fun part of the process was sort of immersing myself in minden it's called minden ontario and just uh seeing what the locals do and how they live and trying to, you know, pay homage to that the best way we could. And Eddie, so the, uh, basically like we've never done a documentary before, obviously you guys know our sketches, but, uh, we kind of got thrown head first into making eight episodes of television. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, so what, what we actually realized was we go up there for like two weeks, film kind of every day. And then we would go back for a week and be like, yeah. all right, what footage did we get? And how the heck does it fit into a story? Because we kind of beat it out, like what eight episodes look like if we didn't get any farther in the case. Like what what could we do to kind of keep people entertained? And it, there was a lot of blind spots or like blank spots that were like, we need something to happen or we're mm. so screwed. Uh -huh. <laughs> and luckily, as we got up there, more things, uh, more things happened, more people came forward and more people were like willing to talk. And it was uh, it was a weird process making a documentary. It's cool, too, because, Gus, you know uh, that kind of atmosphere a lot. It's re very interesting, and I feel like I've heard from you and other people from small towns or, like, experienced it, just how much, like, stories kind of survive of, like, old families in small towns. I, like, you know, I don't... If you ask me anything about the history of my neighbor's family when I grew up, I'd be like, what the fuck do you mean? <laughs> like, I don't know. And like mm -hmm. Gus, I mean, you know that world a lot too. That's I think that's really cool that you get like a preserved kind of like family history when you're in a more rural area. It's pretty cool, and I know that my grandma too for a few decades uh, has done work with the historical society in our town and stuff. So like I've always been privy to that sort of old tales and uh, that old info and stuff like that. And I love all the like urban legend shit, and you you never know like what's what or what's real and stuff and of course everything probably has to have a modicum of truth to it to exist so i that kind of shit is so goddamn fascinating to me is it there, is uh gus for you is there one without being able to give the town away is there a type of urban legend that you remember that like stuck out to you or would that kind of give shit well, away no i mean well i don't mind too if if people find it but uh i've told you before that uh we have uh, a, a sort of our festival days in our town is named after this sheriff that we had in like the 1800s uh, that was just this big old fucking guy. <laughs> like he was like <laughs> seven feet tall. And that was when the national height average was, I think, two foot 11. So it was a big deal back then. <laughs> Uh, but so there's just this tall dude. So like we've got this big tall guy uh, and uh, he just there's a giant statue of this big fucker in our town. And then like our, we have a couple of like days of the of the week every year uh, that are just dedicated to this big guy. But there are talks of uh, a haunted paint mine. Uh, on the river uh, right by our town. And I have actually been there as a child. 
Is it is it haunted? You can't you can't just say I've been there and then leave yeah, you it for a haunted paint. <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, I went over there when I was a little bit of a kid, and we were on a camping trip with uh, my hunting group, and uh, you can go up to these things. Like they had a lot of paint mines by like rivers and smaller tributaries and stuff to really get all the ore. Uh, and sediment out of the soil. I don't know how paint mines work. What, I look like a friggin' art nerd over here? Am I right, fellas? <laughs> Dork. Uh, so I go, we were up there and we would just crawl all over them and stuff, but it was really creepy. So I didn't experience anything like firsthand of like, I saw a, 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 se- a se- scepter, specter? I saw a ghost? Yeah, both, I didn't both. S- didn't see a scepter or a specter or a ghost there, <laughs> but uh, it's goddamn creepy. It's just this old dilapidated shack and a big water mill, and it's just like it's right in the woods, so you, you could be walking through the middle of nowhere and just stumble upon this old creepy shack kind of thing. Very Blair Witchy. Now, when you say you were a little bit of a kid, were yeah. you a kid? <laughs> he was going through what, puberty, uh, so there was a little bit left. There was just there was a little I was, bit left. I was <laughs> dipping my toe in the water being a kid. I was like, I was this a little is bit cool. of a kid. I was a little bit of becoming a man. <laughs> just, <laughs> I got to get a mortgage. This is my last year. <laughs> it's like you're eight, dude. You can hold off on that. Oh, man. In mines. Has there, ever been, has there ever been a mine that's not creepy? No. You say the word mine. It's like, okay, well, death is, exactly. has been here. You know, That's it's just disgusting. Is, Minecraft disgusting. is even a little scary. Oh, well, I didn't think of that. <laughs> yeah, I like to like... picture those carts where you kind of like pump and then it starts going. I know that's like just a, a railroad, but I like to picture them in the mines and it gives me a happy-go-lucky. Yeah. What like, was that? Dum, 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 dum. <laughs> like, and I think Donkey Kong Country or one of those uh, SNES games where you ride the rails in a mine. Which has, we know is you know, based off a true story, so it must have actually happened. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that uh, you, Donkey Kong actually did that. That's a real story, guys. Check, read a history book. <laughs> Dude, did they ever uh is there a monkey that's ever been able to actually operate one of those things? So, who did you just ask that question to? to uh, the ether, the to fucking yeah. natural world here, guys? I'm a student of this earth. Why don't you give me the answers here? Is there right, we're not monkey nerds. We're not monkey nerds. We don't know all the well, monkey stuff. Yeah, I mean, we have a uh, an ongoing battle. I don't know if you guys have heard, um, uh, but we're very worried about a monkey uprising uh, in uh, across the world because, you know, they seem to be getting smart. I actually, on that fucking topic, did you guys see the Neuralink thing yesterday? What? No. 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 Oh my god, it scared the shit out of me. It's that fucking company Elon Musk is doing about like, you know, having shit inside of your brain. And it was yep. like a test they did where they had a monkey with the Neuralink in and they they monitored uh it, it was like a game to move the cursor to where like a it was a bunch a grid of blocks and a block would light up and it would have to use a little joystick to move the cursor that way. And uh they monitored the brain activity of the monkey because it would get a little banana milkshake reward whenever it met the, <laughs> the block. And they pathed out what it looked like in its brain when it was moving in those directions. So then they programmed apparently the Neuralink thing to move without the joystick in its brain. And then it played Pong. And we're, With the- we can't give monkeys that type of power. Dude. <laughs> They played what Pong the with its brain? I'm going to m- confirm this and make sure I didn't just see like a parody video and then we will cut this from the podcast because I'd be too embarrassed. Um, <laughs> well, the banana milkshake the th- thing made me think it was a parody. That's too on the nose for me. Yeah. No, Plus it's right. Yeah. Like yeah. What, banana I searched they- it and there's a CNET article right away from 18 hours ago. Elon Musk Neuralink reveals monkey playing Pong with brain implant. Oh okay. my God. So, so, you could have saved us fuck? some time and just read that article. Yeah. I love how close it is to Donkey Kong because it's monkey pong. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it learned how to play pong wow. with its brain. And here's the thing: I want, I want cool immersive game experiences in the future. There's no way I'm putting a fucking Elon Musk machine in my <laughs> brain. Are you kidding me, dude? That's you're gonna crazy. be. You have any idea, Eddie? If you don't get that thing in there, just how many monkeys are gonna beat you at Pong after Shit, this? Is all that's done? the Whoa. problem. That's how they're gonna get me. They're gonna be like, you don't want a fucking monkey doing things you can't do, do you? <laughs> and, no. and I'm like, well, no. I guess let's go do the surgery then. <laughs> it's like a it's like a pool table, and someone just slams a banana milkshake down. It's like. <laughs> Next game's on me, <laughs> and we're playing. You're getting and you know a hustle who's doing that surgery. You know who's doing that surgery? It's a monkey. No, it's a monkey. Yeah. No. 
Our, our, the mortal em- enemy of the podcast is is um, uh, this guy, Mayor Monkey. He uh, At Disneyland, um, you guys know, uh, and the podcast audience does too, uh, Tony, our, our uh, lord and savior. Um, Tall tale Tony. It was, we were at Disney World once, and with a couple of friends, we were, we were joking that the monkeys, uh, that we were stopping in Monkey Town and kept joking that the monkeys were going to get more advanced and take over Disney World. But now we've seen uh, real Mayor Monkey Twitter accounts tweeting at us, and I'm starting to worry actually for real about the monkey uprising. So Neuralink didn't really help me out, you know? They're so no, Gus, I don't know if they were in mines or whatever the fuck you asked. Right, That's right. fine. By the way, I looked on my phone a couple minutes ago here, and I couldn't find any documented video evidence of a monkey actually operating that minecart thing. <laughs> you got to no. imagine they'd be able to do that pretty easy, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, That's monkey see, monkey do, man. You know, you just start pumping and just, just you're you in there, dude. The thing is, I feel like it, that would work with like a chimpanzee if you just started pumping and then it would get up and start pumping too. I feel like that's not probably if it didn't. I could really strangle you before. <laughs> yeah, <it's not laughs> you alone at this point, it's like I'm not worried about this cart. Like just yeah. Now he, that's he that's would, the uprising. He would strangle you and then put you on the mine cart and then wheel you into the mine and dump you and then wheel <laughs> and off. No one back. would ever find you. It's perfect. God, I'd damn. smoke a cigarette and be like. <laughs> and shrug it just does like the michael jordan shrug like oh. as you're oh, oh. as you're bleeding out you just look and he is at a, a pong station with a banana milkshake straw just, <laughs> sucking it through, just playing he's already distracted doesn't even care about you anymore he's moved on dude. so that's smart that's a tool to use against them in the uprising get them so hooked on pong that like as soon as they think about it it distracts yeah. them from whatever they're doing well, that's, that's that's true What's going to time up hilarious if we, oh, cigarettes, if, yeah. <laughs> if the Neuralink caused a monkey uprising, you could look in the history books and we had the Planet of the Apes remake maybe five years before it happened. And people will go, they were warned. And they, <laughs> they laughed with their banana milkshakes and pong. And I'm going to be sitting here going, I was right the whole time. I saw through that <laughs> fucking monkey a facade. Fun, uh, oh, sorry. I had to cut good. you off. Oh, that was it. No, you're, you're good. Oh, it's right. I just a fun little fact about that movie, the remake, is that's how Jackson and I, like, and uh, our other trophy husband counterpart, John, became friends. We all got high and we watched Dawn of the Planet. No, it was the second one. Which it, that yeah, is Dawn Dawn. 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 It was the Dawn first the... remake, yeah. Or, no, it's, no, it was it's, the tank scene. Oh, Rise, tank first Rise is the first, then Dawn. It was and Dawn. Lore. Dawn. I'm actually okay. a huge nerd of the new that new remake series. The first movie is They're okay, so good. but it, like the first movie is kind of bad until the second half and then the second and third movies oh my god i fucking love them so much i'm so happy mm-hmm. to hear that for, caesar's for like guys. the best character oh my god when i was i think i was in like eighth grade at the time when rise came out and uh and if you if people are listening and they don't want rise spoiled <laughs> skip forward 10 <laughs> seconds when caesar goes no Oh my God! Yeah, I, dude, the shock, so good. the shock when it happens. Okay, if you're listening in now, <laughs> you've avoided the, <laughs> the monkey spoiler. He he it's, grabs Draco Malfoy's hand, like he grabs it. And yep. he's like, no, it's I so good. I forgot about that. That it's those movies are Draco. so good. Everyone should go and rewatch them after watching. For heaven's sake, you like that one, guys? Hell That's yeah, dude! I love slick. that. It's pretty good. Dude. Pretty good on my part. I like plugging things. I um, I'm scared of monkeys. <laughs> I, uh... You know what I'm curious about is, like, I have no way to actually measure this, and I can't put it into scientific terms. But I would be curious to see, like, how good are monkeys' brains right now? Where if you started to give them this accelerated technology, how much evolving would they have to do to have that full self awareness of like? hey, we got to, like, fuck shit up right now because humans are, like, the main threat to us. Like, we got to fucking overtake them. Like, how close are they? Two, three days. (laughs) Two, three days. I I would say, yeah, the side of caution. They they are always two or three days away. So (laughs) so prep yourself There's one scientist that just keeps warning everybody. (laughs) Two days, I swear, they're coming. We got to hold them at Pong. The the day we put a Frogger cartridge in front of them, dude, we are fucked. They will understand everything. There's an old-fashioned, like, lab printer with the, you know, like, the punched holes on the side. It takes 40 minutes to print out. It just says two or three days at best. <laughs> He's like, oh, we gotta show the president. Holy shit! <laughs> I'm just scared yeah. about it. Also, Gus, did you put a twi- uh, question tweet out? Oh no, no, no. 
I almost said question queet. Uh, question so queet. I don't know question. Those out. Uh, yeah, I guess you want to get on that, and we could get it in a little bit. A little question, yeah. Uh, Mike Jackson, I was going to ask you, though, too. How long have you guys been doing sketch comedy shit together? Since about uh, 2013, 2014. When did Dawn of the Planets come out? <laughs> because that will actually answer your question. Was that actually, like, that's when you guys, like, I came think that together came out in 2014. It was the first time we hung out. We met in Second City class, and then the first time we hung out was We yeah, filmed our first weekend. sketch the next day. Yeah. 2014, oh, yep. 2014. There you go. But, yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, it's so interesting like i'm i'm fascinated by your guys journey on the youtubes yeah uh, because it feels like we've we've been on it for a while but we've never done it the right way we've always been like yeah we'll put a you know we'll put it we'll put out a video once in every six months or i mean i eddie you're guilty of, of that but you're yeah. just your videos are incredible well, um, I, so, so are yours, guys. Mine just are algorithmically a little more favored, I think, from the YouTube <laughs> shit. Like, it's just, you know, commentary is a little bit easier to get, I think, some traction on. But, like, uh, no, I mean, that's, uh, I think, uh, for sketch stuff, when I started out, I was just doing sketch stuff and doing the same thing on that grind of, like, moving forward, like, a bit. Um, but uh, especially, I think, now with the, the format you guys went in, that's like this, the, even just the documentary one or seeing more like high budget sketches. That's what I love. Because the first one we saw for people, I mean, I, the people w uh, wouldn't know what our all of us personally meeting would be. I said almost said for the people that don't know, but why would they know? <laughs> Every single person. But yeah. yeah, we were at Buffer Fest and the sketch you guys showed, I remember being so hilarious that we were like, we got to find these guys at the party later. And then we, I feel like we, I'll say it, we. We all hit it off. We hit it off right away. <laughs> we hit it That's off what hard. Happened. Guys, you you were like the festival vets. We were just cutting our teeth and we we're like the thing let's is, lock in with these guys. The thing is though, Jackson, that was our second year, and the year before we were so like terrified of everyone because we had never <laughs> been to a YouTube thing ever. And so if that's how we appeared the next year, it was a lie. It was a total <laughs> lie. Because we the first year we went. Gus and I were way smaller and we were just, we'd never been to a YouTube thing ever. And mm -hmm. so we were just like, I don't, we don't want to bother anyone. And so we just kind of like stood in the corner, you know, like the whole weekend pretty much. And everyone was really nice. We just like, didn't know, you know, what to do. Um, so yeah, like was, Gus, Gus, is that your experience the, too? Oh, wait, sorry, Mike. <laughs> oh, dude. I mean, without a doubt. I mean, that's, that's like, I, I'm sure you guys have been to like, event stuff like that it, it, it is such an atmosphere of just like what are, hey you know it's so like inherently a little bit awkward when there's just so many people in there and shit so we got there the first year and we were just like should, should we, i don't know should we go stand over there now okay like it was just that uncomfortable <laughs> we would go hide in our room for a bit we would for real be like okay well like we've sat on this couch alone for maybe 15 minutes. Maybe we can make a reappearance in an hour and like, we'll get to <laughs> less awkwardly move into a conversation. You know, mm -hmm. we're playing that balls game on our phone for hours. Oh in the my hotel God. Room. You guys know about the balls game pong with a Z with a Z. <laughs> oh, literally the balls game. It's, no. it's just, and I, I'm not even recommending it cause it's got like shitty ads and I don't want to promote an app at all. It's just like one of the games where you just like you shoot, uh, shoot a, it's like the, what is it? Uh, is it breakout? Out or yeah, uh, yeah okay. breakout. It's like that, yeah. but you keep getting more and more balls like throughout the game as you're going forward, and it's like each block is harder to break. But it's just a stupid app. But Gus and I would just be like too nervous, and we just go and be sitting on two separate beds in the hotel, just like playing an app silently. Like, so should we get up and back out there, or do you think? <laughs> yeah, just a few more levels of balls. The way I remember it is. You guys walked into like the YouTube space after party and then turned towards us and went, ah, old sport. And they like grabbed a piece of champagne, <laughs> like called it. the wait waiter by name, like Marcus <laughs> or something. And they were like, oh, you guys will get used to it here. And then you asked the DJ to play a song. And you guys did like an in unison, like weird version of the floss. It hadn't even been invented yet. And yeah, it was beautiful. It. Like Jackson and I were really impressed. You know? We just produced two microphones, and you're like, I don't know how those were produced, let alone synced to the existing sound system in here. Those aren't even matching with the other ones in use right now. It's just we had all the bases covered. I, yeah, uh, it was exactly that. I heard, aren't they closing those YouTube spaces down? Oh, they yeah. I think, I think I had heard that they're closing the Toronto one down. Is that accurate, or did I just say that, and I won't back it up? And I think they already the closed that one down a bit ago. I think they're maybe closing, like, London. and so I don't know what it is. I mean, I'll say 
I'm sorry, YouTube. There is no uh, more pointless of a fucking building than those YouTube spaces, dude. <laughs> those YouTube spaces are made to look like high schools just for, like, high school shitty Instagram sketch comedy and shit like that. And you're like, okay, right. well. <laughs> yeah. Um, the LA one's pretty helpful, though. They got, like, I, I think some, uh, like, a uh, big kind of soundstaged things. And so that's good. But, like, if it's just a couple of rooms, it's like, what are we supposed to do here? I don't understand. <laughs> exactly. We got to go to a party there, and then we got to go to a screening of eighth grade, the Bo Burnham oh, movie. Yeah. Oh, and cool. And Mike, Mike met Bo Burnham. So I've we, met Bo we Burnham. do have good memories there. So yeah, let's hear about that more. Let's hear. <laughs> oh, let me dive in. Thanks, Jackson, for really bringing that up. <laughs> uh, no, no, it was, it was basically like, uh, you had to have over a thousand subscribers and for like your audience, Jackson and I are just barely over a thousand. Like we really, we really haven't done the YouTube game properly, but anyways, it was so, so we used, we used, uh, our friends like saying we're a part of his sketch troupe and he had just over a thousand. So we got into this, uh, screening of eighth grade and we're all like, Oh, free, free beer, like free food. This is great. This is the YouTube life. And then uh, Bo Burnham shows up, and he was—he's tall. He's like six four, and I don't normally get starstruck, uh, but that guy like has shaped at least my form of comedy, and I think yep. he's just like this genius. You know, someone who says I never get starstruck is always starstruck. I get. <laughs> <laughs> no, for I real, though, never get. I, but for I for Bo, I've like I've. <laughs> just i've said before like i don't even know how to react if i got to meet bo burnham i'd be so lame and nervous because he's bo burnham you know well, like, that just lines so... up perfectly with mike's story yeah <laughs> so every, everyone basically goes and takes their seat and then i would like i was like oh i might as well get some uh, they had some really good hors d'oeuvres like this coconut shrimp or something so i was like uh, i was out there and bo burnham was looking at the food and it was just me and him and i was just like hey bo coconut <laughs> shrimp it's really it's really good it? and he's like yeah, yeah yeah i was like it's good you want to go for one of those he goes okay i'll go for one of those and then we, we started talking and uh one of my other friends came up and he's a goofball uh he basically started talking to bo about youtube and how it's a pyramid scheme and <laughs> bo's what? like i don't care like, <laughs> Wait, what's the logic behind the pyramid scheme? Yeah, what was, the, Susan's at the was, top, man. It trickles down, bro. Exactly. So his whole thing was like, he's like, man, like YouTube, I, oh, you obviously got out of it, man. And he's like this weird, like washed up guy where he's just like, ah, man, like the big get bigger and you're just screwing over the, the little guys, you know? And Bo's like, yeah, totally, man. Like, cool. Yeah. I should probably go watch my movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it sounds like you had the meat cute at least, though, with the old coconut shrimp thing. Oh, totally. He remembers me. Yeah, I'm be, sure he does. Coconut shrimp guy. And I'll be like, hey, man. <laughs> you know Those what? It was good. good. It, yeah, was it was good. <laughs> it really, and I would have really really never was. gone for it if it wasn't for you, so I, uh, it stuck out of my memory. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, do you want to make out? That's exactly what I imagined. Then, then Mike wakes up. <laughs> then Mike wakes up. <laughs> I was gonna ask you guys here. So you mentioned Second City before. Uh, mm -hmm. I've always been fascinated. Like I think Eddie and I come from the lightest possible versions of like Midwestern school-based improv stuff. If <laughs> is that a fair assessment, Eddie? Like, yeah, no, both... I had no problems. You don't even. If you were worried, I was like, hey, no, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we both we have a huge love for it and watching it. We did it a bit when we were when we were coming up a bit. But you guys actually went through like the Second City system. Like, what what is that even like? Let alone up in Canada. It's a pyramid scheme. Man. No, is it, dude? No, no, I no, fucking no, knew it, dude. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's great. It's like, I don't know. I'll, I'll let Jack speak for it too, but it's just, uh, you find the people you have chemistry with and like you, you kind of, uh, drift towards people that have a similar sense of humor. And that's why Jackson and John and I found each other. Uh, there's some odd balls, like some, there's some divorcees in the first level that are just trying to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. And they're just like this, the higher you get, the slowly you kind of weed out the people that like didn't actually want to be serious about it right mm -hmm. um sure so it's, uh, yeah I, i've i've had nothing but good uh good experiences there and jackson's yeah. a really good improviser like, way better <laughs> than me i love it it's um yeah way i've met some of my best friends and like mike said like-minded people and we're lucky enough to have really great teachers and a tight-knit community where you'll take classes with people and then you'll see them out at shows and you'll see them improve and you'll uh, you'll get to go on stage with your teachers and 
uh, sort of anybody who's willing to give it a shot um, can get on stage in Toronto, which is very cool. And it's something I miss dearly now. Haven't done it in over a year. And it really you don't realize how much it means to you until it's gone. So mm-hmm. uh, once the time is, uh, you know, once we can go back to taking classes and stuff, if you've ever thought about it, just go for it because it is worth it. You never know when you might have another pandemic and you can't do it. Damn. But you, you guys, you guys have like a just a, such a great chemistry. It's so clear you guys are both on the same bur- and like wavelength. It's as you're so talking. fake, Mike. It's so fake and altered and made up. You know that Gus and it's I fucking despise each other, dude. Usually it it's just unadulterated edit. punching whenever we're in the same room together. <laughs> and we're punching up until they say, mic check, okay, camera rolling, and then we stop for like four to five seconds. And, and I don't know shit. who says it because we don't have any production <laughs> it's just a, it, The neighbors figured out that that's the only way they can get us to stop punching and yelling for a few minutes. Mic check! Okay. Uh, yeah, we quiet down right away. <laughs> yeah. um, well, am I remembering incorrectly, or did you guys say that also through uh, your like comedy circle stuff that you've uh, – uh, you guys know Curtis, right? Right? Yeah, Curtis was at that uh that Bo Burnham thing. Um, yeah, Curtis, Curtis oh, Connor wow. for for Curtis people, Connor. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, just I remember uh, you guys mentioning that and being like, "Oh, holy shit!" Like small world because I didn't know because we knew you guys and we knew Curtis, but I didn't know you guys knew each other. Yeah, that is pretty goddamn cool. It is. Yeah, there's a Don't small guys... net community, like I said, of people who are really taking it seriously. So you see him around. Aren't you guys just fucking tired of that Curtis Connor guy? Am I right? <laughs> oh, God. Don't he's even such, get me started. He's so but, soothing. How can you oh, get tired of him? I'm, I'm kidding. Guy. I love Curtis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what is uh? I I I'm really curious too because like I I. I'm super into like any groundling stuff out here, especially like I was a S- Sabrina. My girlfriend got me like the season pass holder membership thing or whatever it's officially called before the pandemic. And I'd go to shows and stuff all the time. And I have a few friends that went through like the groundling system and stuff. But I'm just curious to like hear from like a tiered perspective, like how does a second city structure work? Like, are there groups of people where they have like a main stage show uh, or is there like a regular, just kind of longer form improv show that people get swapped through? Like, how do you get to the point where it's like you're in front of people regularly and you're actually doing those shows in second city? Sure. Well, um, the main, main cast is usually six people. That's uh, main stage. That's like the height of it. That's you're doing nightly shows twice on the weekend. And that's like your full time gig. That's what everyone wants. Mm-hmm. Below that is the travel co, which is like the go out um, to schools, to events all around Canada, sort of promote Second City, promote improv. And that's a full time gig usually too. Uh, it doesn't pay as well or anything, but you know, you're doing improv all the time. Mm-hmm. And then below that is what's called House Co, which is uh, on the secondary stage at Second City, the smaller stage, you'll perform once or twice a week for usually a pretty small crowd, uh, unpaid. But you're, it's like, that's like the minor leagues where like they're sort of stacking up who they think will be next for the main stage. And you work your way through all of that and hopefully eventually end up as one of the very few lucky people who's you know, working on main stage. Um, and how Mike and I, the way you go through that is you take the level A to E improv classes. And then if you like it, you audition for what's called the conservatory, which is like the, you know, uh, the people who are the best through the classes, I guess, usually get through that. And then that takes a year and you do a big show at the end that you've written. And then from then, you know, you start auditioning for the big boys. How I've always wondered that even with, um, with those improv pats or with SNL, like, uh, or like any of the audition stuff for that. How fucking nerve wracking is it to do an improv audition? Like, is yeah, that just like sucks. the worst? Cause suck, you're like, it, it could go either way, even if you feel really confident. Cause you know, like any night can be whatever. Precisely. Yeah. I mean, with an audition, a scripted audition, right? You're rehearsing, you're still nervous, but you, you, if you know your words, like the back of your hand, then at least you have some confidence, but usually you're going into an improv audition with someone you don't know that well, and you're just hoping that you connect. You're just hoping that, you know, you're on that day or whatever. So it can be nerve wracking, but the best way to do it is just, you know, let go, try and just yeah. you're like, whatever happens, happens, have faith yeah. in your abilities, but it can be nerve wracking. Absolutely. Does it get like super, I'm not looking to try to dig up dirt or anything, but is it like <laughs> kind of cutthroat and stuff? Are their feelings hurt sometimes and people just get disappointed? And is it like a competitive environment up there? Because I've heard that about the groundlings in LA. I'm just not sure what the Toronto Second City scene's like. 
That's you, yeah. Sorry, what are you gonna say? I don't think it's uh, not to your face anyway. But there are only like six or seven jobs that really pay, so mm-hmm. it's competitive. I don't know if it's cutthroat, but it's totally competitive. And some people who are like you know didn't work their way through the system, who are, but are just hilarious, can jump people who may have felt like they were in line for something. But mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think it stands to reason that the funniest person usually gets the job. At least that's what I've been seeing. So that's the best way. That's all you can hope for. I hope. Yeah. Not yeah. totally. Totally. God, that whole thing totally. is fucking fascinating, dude. I, I would love to go see a show up there sometime. Yeah, well, next time you guys come up, we'll do a whole Second City. We'll do a whole improv uh, retreat oh, for great, you guys. Dude. That sounds yeah. great. I'll just crash on your couch for like two and like tw- 15 weeks or so months. and be so good. Yeah, like tight 15 or up there. You know, you guys free all of 2022? Because if, if that doesn't, if you don't mind that, I can bring, I'll bring my own blanket. So absolutely yeah to, you, you got like know, an l place. couch we got like an elk so you can really spread dude. out on that thing <laughs> i i don't know what it is about l couches that just my brain's like yes i don't know yeah. why but <laughs> dude, it's I like fucking love it. i just dude. got one a couple months ago i'm so jealous L-couch. i don't have the space in this apartment and the second i get a house i'm getting 15 l couches Oh my god <laughs> just fitting them together like tetris that's yeah, awesome. we just had my living room L couches. Lowercase oh. L couches. <laughs> I got a little uh, pregunta here from Twitter. We've got the questions are flowing in right now, boys. That's Should we hit them up? Hear. All right, let's look over here. Gang, we've got some preguntas. Uh, just wanted to translate. Uh, preguntas actually means questions in English. Uh, so now you know. Uh, ask <laughs> us all your questions here. We got one from somebody named. E. That's, there's a lot of E's. I didn't know how to make it more succinct. Oh, but. Yeah, no, yeah. Actually, he did a good he, job. He was, he was at the 8th grade screening too. <laughs> was he really? No, just kidding. Was, he, just kidding. was he saying that during the, uh, during the Q&A? Just E. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He was Bo's really like, trying to get his hand up. Yeah, He's like, like dude, get out of here, man. <laughs> anyway, E asks, who would win in a fight? Mike Jackson or Michael Jackson? Yeah, Good we've talked God. about this. We've talked about <laughs> this. I was this. like, how many yeah, fucking times have you here. gotten that one? <laughs> yeah, I've told Jackson like almost every day because we're roommates. So every time he wakes up, he comes upstairs, I go, I'm slippery. You can never <laughs> catch me. And then, uh, but he, he always, he has a great master lock. So it's a whole conversation. Michael Jackson would probably take both of us out. Yeah. He's I got mean, the kicks. He's you know? dude. <laughs> probably lethal kicks. You ever seen that fucker just... They're so lightning fast. They break the sound they, barrier. You th- yeah, you think that makes uh, like they cut it out of documentaries and stuff, but uh, it would make the whip noise when he do that one kick. I yes, think so. uh, we're all picturing the same kick, and 100 yeah, percent it does the make same that kick. sound. It's you hear you hear a whip noise and his his bones crackling around, and that's about. And you it. have to grab your crotch ever so just yeah. as it's happening. <laughs> Can you imagine? Seeing Michael Jackson do those two kicks, just two kicks taking you both out, just one just like, <laughs> a quick to the jaw to both that you just drop and you both. I, I always like in movies when someone like wipes their blood off their, their like lip and they go, guess we're fighting or something. That's what I would yeah. hope I would do back to Michael Jackson. You're going to have to kick oh. harder than that, Michael. <laughs> Man's got some moves. Time to dance. <laughs> This is after like, moonwalk and you break your own legs. <laughs> yeah, you sprain your ankle every single like backslide. <laughs> ow, 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 ow. Oh yeah, I can't do it. Yeah, he'd kick our ass, no doubt about it. <laughs> probably, probably. He'd probably take all four of us, no problem. Yeah, I don't think I don't think I'd be able to do anything. You ever see the Thriller music video? He's he's <laughs> could fuck hard, dude. He could bite you. I usually don't get starstruck, hard. but I was fighting Michael Jackson one time. And it, just, it just really freaked me out. Started you, telling him about usually about the how other MTV celebs is I fight. a pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Anyway, Mikey Jackson's gonna take the gold on that one. Uh, we got another question here from at Aiden seventy one six zero one. Everyone's got fucking numbers in their usernames now. I don't know what happened. Get creative, uh, people. Yeah, exactly. Can't be confined to one kind of uh, letter. Uh, Aiden says, opinion on parents keeping baby teeth? I personally think it's weird to keep a body part that fell out of another person. Wait, parents keep baby teeth? 
Okay, so now I'm finding out that I'm on the other side of the no. fence of you once again, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> I like probably got keep all my baby stuff. teeth at home. I don't know where they are, but I know I like I got some of them at least. So like I'm sure this is a common thing. However, I'm not gonna hold back <laughs> in saying that's fucking weird, dude. Well, it looks <laughs> like you're so not getting any of them, Eddie. Weird as shit. You're telling me. That it's normal for a lot of people to be like, mm, we kept part of Gus's skull from when he was a baby. <laughs> like, dude, that's so weird, I would keep dude. that in a heartbeat. It's like, I'm what never going to grow these again. Well, I could <laughs> repurpose these into a lamp, perhaps? A coaster? Uh, a necklace? Yeah, a necklace. A necklace. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Charm people, bracelet? Parents keep um, your first haircut. They'll keep that hair. My mom's kept every haircut Th- I've ever had. <laughs> first haircut. It's all in the basement. It's just like big garbage bags of hair. And she goes, one day you'll need it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know what that means, but first haircut it's... sounds normal to me. But I just if it's okay, not, so Gus, did you weird. do the tooth? Did your parents do the tooth fairy when you were a kid? They didn't really. It was always the thing of like they would say it, and they knew that I knew it wasn't real because my parents also did not do Santa. But they did it like oh. you did it with the money and everything. Yeah, like I was just like, okay, I'm putting it under the the pillow, and we were all very self aware, like, okay, you know, I hope so, the tooth fairy comes tonight, and then they give me the money under the pillow. Don't worry, what you're saying is making it worse <laughs> for you. So uh, what I'm <laughs> what I'm saying is essentially, then, especially because they didn't pretend, your parents were essentially just purchasing baby teeth from you just so yeah. they could keep it as a decoration they were paying you just to <laughs> e- each tooth just okay this one will go great with the collection of baby teeth and i'll add that there Dude. i'm sure there's something a lot of families do i hate this i hate it already <laughs> you know what i just remembered and i this you, you completely dug up a thought that i hadn't had in 20 years is i forgot that when i was really little one of my grandma's made me a tooth fairy pillow like it was this little red like i think it was mickey mouse print on it and it was this tiny throw pillow and there was a a tiny little pocket in the back of it and the idea was that you put your tooth in this micro pocket and then uh like when you sleep and wake up the next morning the tooth would be gone but then there'd be a dollar in there but every time i did that the tooth was still in there and the and the money was in there so i just had all these teeth (laughs) <laughs> Wait, for how? So they didn't how take long? the tooth. No, they didn't take the they tooth. It was just sort of a like I, I, it was a loner left. tooth. It was how not long a trans- they had way with it and then left it. You keep disgusting. This. You hold you on to this, this huh? moment. <laughs> Gus, it's... how long and how many teeth in the pillow? Um, I mean, I'm not trying to distance myself from it, but I can't imagine it lasted past, like, age seven or so, or eight, maybe. Like, I was really, really fucking young. I'm saying, I'm saying, how long did how, the period of time where teeth were remaining in the pillow last. Oh, oh, I'd take it out the next day. I, okay, I, don't I was like I'd wondering if yeah, you no, leave it in. teeth in there? And I was like, we have a whole different conversation now. <laughs> Sleeping on like a bacteria sponge for 10 oh years. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, Jesus, this is so unsettling. I have my okay, wisdom teeth gonna... too. Do you guys have those? I still got my I got my wisdom teeth in. My I got super lucky and I was told that none of them were a problem. Same, I have Yet. mine in my skull. That's what I'm talking no, about, yeah, Jackson. Yeah. I don't have mine. Yeah, I, I got rid of those suck. at Viking funeral. I Dude, just put yeah, them on a boat suck. and sent them off. <laughs> just torched them in the driveway. Just like had yeah, a we lit got arrow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the most terrifying thing when I was younger, I remember uh, so I um, up until I was in like third grade I uh, my, my great grandmother was alive she's in her 90s and she was um, uh, from Sicily but only like as a little kid and then she her family moved to the US um, but she lived like through the depression era and I remember like I was seven and I had a loose tooth and we were heading for my grandma's where my great grandma also lived and my dad very seriously was like do not show that you have a loose tooth. I was Uh-oh. like what? And he's like, your great grandma's from a different time. She will pull that out of your mouth if she sees that you have a loose tooth. She will oh just, and God. I was just like, okay. And it was just, I get it. Like depression era, like, oh, you got that? I'll take it out, you know? And I was just like, I, okay, I got to hide this the whole time. I just, I was so oh. terrified. <laughs> Weird. She's a very sweet woman, though, actually a very great woman and an incredible cook. So I don't want to – I'm not shit-talking my great-grandma. She's great, but she she pulled teeth. That's one thing she did. <laughs> this I is like not a, this, go there with loose teeth. <laughs> this was a total sidebar, but Eddie, your story made me think of this. I was on a park date recently, uh-huh. and uh, 
like you know covid park day you gotta walk in the park you walk together yeah, yeah. uh and so basically she was telling me that she was like super into uh like for csi when she was a kid so she got one of those little csi kits and she like finger parent like fingerprinted all of her parents for fun and stuff but then she proved that santa wasn't real because she got the fingerprint on the glass uh, that like the milk and cookies and matched it to her parents' fingerprints oh and they had God. to come clean to her. And oh I was like, that is fascinating. <laughs> you are a there smart was, kid. I had something kind of similar where one year um, for our birthday, do you guys remember the spy gear toys? Yes. They yes. were the coolest yeah, fucking yeah. toys on the planet. And then they would also do the, you know, like McDonald's run where you get the like dollar version. But I had a couple of spy gear toys because I was obsessed with them. And one year I got like the dream gift. And I th I don't even know, it must have been like probably like 30 bucks, but it was a uh, it was an RC car with a camera on it and then you could wear little glasses that showed feedback from the camera. It was the That's craziest cool. thing I'd ever got in my life and I first off just uh, for the future I broke it almost immediately. <laughs> and it was just done for. But it was uh Tony and I our birthday is November 28th, so it's really close to Christmas. And one year we were like we are going to leave out the toy in our living room facing the tree and that way we'll know if Santa's real or not and then we, we got toward that bit of the night and both of us were just like I think we were a little too old where we kind of knew and we were like let's just not like find it out you know like it was it was like probably a year away from us finding out and I think we kind of already knew the answer and we we're like Let's not ruin Christmas. Let's just go to bed. <laughs> so we ended up doing that instead. You guys are good kids. You're good yeah. kids. It's just, I, I feel like I would have ruined it for myself. Uh, yeah, so um, I, yeah, I guess... Kind of what kind I'm of know-it-all brat are you dating, Mike? Who's like, I need to know exactly who's doing Yeah, why this. didn't she follow through? <laughs> why, or why didn't she decide the same decision as me, Mike? Yeah, it's and true. first of all, fingerprints don't prove anything. Of course, we could have touched the same glass as Santa. That's not uh, going to be admissible in court. He first wears of the all. white gloves. He wears gloves. Why would he? Yeah. Okay. No, I agree with Let's you guys. This Honestly, girl I agree. On the There's a couple holes in the I case. I think we need to. <laughs> I think we need to get her on the podcast right now. Let's do heaven's heaven's sake too. That girl. That and girl. Santa. That <laughs> childhood. <laughs> I wanted to ask you guys, though, because we are you know, thinking about documentaries and stuff and a new sort of uh, worlds to explore. And obviously, social media slash YouTube is something we're all interested in. I was wondering if you guys thought, you know, a documentary about social media or influencers, people uh, l like yourselves, what's an angle that hasn't been done already? Because when I think of it, I think of like, you know, people who are like, you know, all these likes are mostly fake. I can make anybody famous in a day. And then like they kind of can, but can't really. Or like yeah. the opposite where it's like, uh, you know, these look how hard some of these people work for you know, like next to no likes. There's uh, I've seen a ton of different takes. I was wondering if there's any sort of angle that hasn't been done to death about that. I think either way. And also, I, I thought of this right before you started saying that uh, if you were to make the Santa sequel to For Heaven's Sake, you would call it For Goodness Sake. That's a great joke. Yeah. Anyways, I'll keep going. <laughs> um, no, I think, yeah, Jackson, I think most of the documentaries that I see about influencer stuff are always about, I don't know, it's like the worst side of social media is the most interesting, usually, like mm. the Instagram influencers or the TikTok people. But it's also like, I don't know. I, I feel like there's there's a side of just like cool people doing shit, but I don't know if that's like super interesting. But I will definitely say I feel like the, the biggest hole of what's being examined in social media stuff is um, businessmen with uh, like using teens now for like Instagram and TikTok to make right. like a shit ton of money mm -hmm. and especially kind of screw them over. It's like there was a bit of it in uh, this documentary called Jawline on, on Hulu, um, and it was when Musical.ly was going. But yeah, right. I don't know. It's like because I feel like social media all has like a really a lot of like messed up stuff that could be really compelling. But then there's also like good, just kind of like decent creators on YouTube that don't get covered. I, I'm not really sure. Gus, you got something? Well, one thing that came to mind, and I don't know if it's a big, like, kind of poster topic or something, but I, I certainly see it all the time, is especially, like, you know, Eddie and I work with advertisers, uh, you know, semi-frequently, both on the podcast and on our individual channels and stuff, and it's pretty clear uh, what you absolutely have to do for, like, FTC disclosures and stuff. Like, you have to let people know that there's an ad happening, you know, and the amount of 
people that I do see online, especially more t traditional media people that are working in this like online space, I see so many instances of people like obviously doing ads and stuff and integrations and not even remotely like declaring it and stuff. And <clears throat> without like, you know, like saying names of companies or whatever, but I had, I have been in meetings in the past uh, with people where I've been told like, hey, you know, we could probably come up with some strategies to like get you to do some sponsors and stuff where you didn't need to disclose it's an ad. And I have not done that, you know, obviously yeah. for the record, like I do not fucking do that. But I'm just saying like, I know that these conversations are starting behind the scenes and stuff. And it is an absolute like real thing of like people doing ads and shit all the time where you're like, okay, well they didn't put hashtag ad and they didn't say that they were sponsored and it wasn't like blatantly obvious enough. But I was like, I know the shit's happening. Like, and I know the people that those guys might be working with are like, these people tried to do the same fucking shit to me. You know what I mean? Like, so I, but again, I don't know if that's like big, super sexy topic -y stuff, but that's really what comes to mind over here. But I, I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's my no, definitely idea. even, even post podcast. will like even, uh, probably get back to you guys are just talking about that stuff. Cause yeah, yeah, it, totally. It's, I, I do think also, yeah, uh, there's this really unfair thing. This might not, not even uh, talking about like documentary stuff, but I think it, this applies to you guys too. It's like this really unfair thing with the algorithm now where it's just like, you can make like really great, really funny sketch content and YouTube will be like, yeah, we'll show a couple people. And then mm -hmm. you can make a completely new channel where you just like react to something and they're like, this is the greatest thing you've ever made. You know, right. like, and they'll just like put it out. You know, there are some channels that will post their first like commentary video and they'll get like a hundred thousand subscribers in like 10 days. And it's just like, yeah. I, I, I really, I don't know what they could do, but I really wish there was more of a push, especially for um, like not only sketch comedy, but like documentaries and just like not a specific type of content to get pushed a lot, you know? Um, for sure. Mm -hmm. We used awesome. to, or I, I used to like to make a living. I used to work for like social media agencies and I'd be mm -hmm. like the middleman. If Gus, like a sponsor came to you, but it had to look like more professional, I would make it look like your video, but also you were promoting McDonald's Big Mac or something. Mm -hmm. And so I lived in this world where it was like, I was in those meetings with like, kind of like you're talking about where like people are like, we should hide the ads here. Or we should make it feel like this. Yeah. And it's just... It is kind of gross. It's like, yeah. I don't know. I, it's I'm a, it's in a, a weird, constant it's fight a... with them always. Even um, like uh, not, uh, I'm not naming any brand names or anything because, you know, like there's some, some that I'm actually really, I have a cool relationship with and I'm allowed to do like kind of what I want. But there have been multiple times over the last like three or four years where I've been doing sponsorships where I'll get a note that is like, hey, so it was pretty clear he was reading off a script can he like make it seem like it's more of his personal thoughts and like he feels it and I will straight up go like, no, absolutely not. No. Why the fuck would I do that? You know? Um, and it's like that part really always makes me feel gross. Yeah. Where it's like, they're essentially going, could you hide the fact that we're paying you and lie yeah. to the people that watch you? It's like, no, of course not. We have hey, like Eddie, a, a Eddie, trust, no one's going to buy this if you just read the thing we gave you. So if yeah. you could just, you know, pretend that it actually matters to you, that would be great. And the like, funny no, thing too, that's what the money's is, for. Thank you. Is like hearing back from brands is when they allow you to read the script and also joke about what you want you sell more of their stuff. It works out for everybody. You get it to be really honest. Does. It really and it's, does. it's cause usually I feel like all of us, when we do YouTube stuff, our audiences are a bit older and it's like for them, maybe for kids being energetic about it might work more. But like if I'm an adult and I'm watching a YouTuber I like and their ad respects the fact that I know they're getting paid, I'm more likely to care about that company. Cause I'm like, oh, they allowed them to like joke about how they're doing this just for money or something like that. And it makes me like the the company even more. I feel like, yeah, totally. That honesty translates. They have a sense I of humor. More people would yeah, exactly. That. Yeah. Um, I, I, need I was gonna to ask you guys. My Big Mac ad. Wait, what's up? <laughs> where were you? Where were you going? Where were you going? I just said I need Mike to touch up my Big Mac ad, though. Yeah, Dude, I, could, up, I could make it polished because then because okay, then they're, I'm the middleman that they get mad at. They're like, this doesn't look like we thought it was gonna look, and then uh, it, it was a whole career. It's still going still good but uh yeah. i was gonna ask you guys have you guys ever been through like the pitching process you might not be able to talk about it but like have you guys ever pitched 
a TV show or have you ever like not like a traditional kind of going in like there's like conversations at certain places but never like a traditional like prepared pitch where we've got like a presentation or anything like that I'm yes. actually doing that right now oh yeah yeah uh, I've made a pitch deck I'm I'm working with our manager on it and uh, I am trying to get a series pitched this year uh, I, I mean, I've said before, like, I want to I wanna make a sketch show, you know, so I want the sketch show to go. Uh, but I'm working on that right now, and it's it's interesting. It's a different dynamic because it's like I'm, I'm so accustomed to being able to kind of just not have to really run things past people, you know, on the channel. It's really just like, hey, you know, do you want – I'm going to just go shoot the sketch with a friend or my brother <laughs> or something. Like, let's go do it. But it's – it is really, it's difficult to try to be like, how do I put shit on paper and in a presentation to convince people to be like, this, can you just give me a little money and just, I, I promise it'll be all right. Like, I think just, you got to kind of meet me halfway here, you know, because this is not the most traditional looking thing. So I am very much learning a lot of shit right now in that sense, but... Yeah, the best way it was described to us was it's a song and dance. You got to do a little song and dance for these guys. Mm -hmm. Show them that, uh, you know that it's worth investing in basically but we did that whole pitch serious circuit trying to get this show made and it was both exhilarating and sort of terrifying at the same time because you know being in those big rooms sort of bearing your soul a little bit but also just trying to trying to stick to the script it's mm -hmm. like a weird balance yeah because i'm assuming like just being at like a couple of those big company places like the excit yeah the excitement is there but also the pressure is on probably a ton too because you're like especially yeah if you're so Jax and i like we were little fish in a big pond and we didn't shy away from that we would like take netflix candies and any water bottles they would give us uh, and we'd just like bring them with us mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, when we were in the move. actual rooms it was uh it was like we had a pitch script so it was like i don't even know 40 minutes of and there was like an, an intro off the top from Funny or Die and uh, the other production company, Muse, we worked with. And then the rest was Jackson and I. The entire thing was just us talking and like making it feel like it wasn't memorized and like this is just how we talk. But everything had to like connect to a slideshow. So we had to say like certain words and like the picture would appear behind us. It was wild. It was Damn. crazy. That is but, such a song and dance routine then. Did you, do you guys feel too like, do you feel the most confident when you're in person like that and like hey when i can just get people face to face then maybe i can provide more of a specific explanation about this or like where do you feel like your pitch forte was yeah i think certainly in the case of this show because it is uh sort of a a different uh spin on a known genre so it doesn't necessarily translate great on paper like Eddie said, like, are you going to put a, like, how are you going to infuse comedy into this 87 year old case? It just on paper might not sound doable. Uh, so yeah, being there in person, getting, you know, to sort of exercise our improv style and just our, pr our presentation, like being performers, uh, it works well in a room. And I think that is definitely our strength versus, you know, we we're really proud of the pitch deck and everything that we wrote. We had a lot of help with that too. And like, that is good stuff, but on its own. Uh, it's only half of the pie and the other half was us, you know, just being us in person. And I think that is a big difference. Mm -hmm. I, I, and perhaps that's even a fault of mine, but I always feel like if I can just get somebody in person and like, I, I mean, I, I'd be honest and stuff too, but you know, there's that razzmatazz factor of like, dude, like here's <laughs> my vibe. Here's the tone of how I'm speaking to you. This is going to translate somewhat to like the final product and stuff. And, and it feels weird because it's like, especially when, you know, and I have not gone, gone into doing formal pitching in person or anything yet or anything with this project, but like there's going to be an element of the kind of like, hey, trust me on this one, fellas, you know, <laughs> like, and, right, but also yeah. you have, which you when have you're a... asking for millions of dollars, <laughs> it's not really the best pitch. <laughs> Yeah, but you have the fan, but you have that fan you base you to show for to... it. You're like, hey, I got 25 million views on this one sketch. And they're like, oh, that's cool, man. <laughs> and and hopefully, <laughs> that's what they'll say. hopefully that'll work. And it is unfortunate how much shit just is like, and, and you see this in both sometimes when people get hired for gigs or projects that get greenlit where it's just like, it seems like there wasn't really a sense of tonal consistency from both the creator to the corporate and studio level on here. And it's like, mm -hmm. did they just grab somebody because they had a few numbers and they just were like, toss them into this thing. I don't know. Yeah. Here's the oh, digital budget. They do, right? You know what I mean? They absolutely but, do. I don't yeah. know. But that's uh, we, we were lucky with our 
network execs they really trusted our team but i feel like that happens a lot where people are just like they think they know gus and they're like no this isn't gus you're more eh. yeah exactly. <laughs> they're like trying to change you to know you better and it's like what the heck are you talking about yeah do your thing you know what that that reminds me of a funny like i i was seeing a john mulaney interview i think it was on off camera show or whatever and he talked about writing sketches for guest stars and shit uh, and he said that early on, that's one thing that kind of he realized when he was pitching sketches to guest stars is like sometimes you'd write something and it'd be without even needing an example. He just is like, hey, you know, do then you do the thing that you do. And the guys, I don't I don't know. <laughs> like, Yeah, you know, that thing. Do your thing like you do the thing, you know, and it's just interesting to like have other people's perceptions of like what your whole vibe or shtick is and stuff. So, <laughs> so true. Yeah. Do that. Your classic catchphrase, oh, I don't know. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and everyone erupts in laughter. Like, that's your thing. We Dude, love that thing. Like, I didn't even realize that. Oh, I shit. I didn't know I no, did that. Like, I don't know. Do you see John was saying, do the thing that you do to OJ Simpson? Why are we even going <laughs> to host today? <laughs> I don't even think it's it's okay to have him here. Dude, if OJ <laughs> like, Simpson hosts SNL, that would be nice. <laughs> that would actually be Do the, the glove. Try the glove things. on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> He would do it too. That's the thing. I feel like he would do actually it be pretty heartbeat. awesome. I bet. <laughs> but they I would never do it. I would hate that I would have to watch it. Live yeah, too. I wouldn't want to support it in any way. But you know, I'm not missing OJ Simpson on SNL. <laughs> There's no way. Do you think he would come out and just start the the monologue? He'd say, "Hey, Twitter world." <laughs> yeah, he would. yeah. Okay, it good. would be it would Him? be uh, SNL uh, with or hosted by OJ Simpson with musical guest Imagine Dragons. That's the <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> uh. it's, it's 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 OJ and uh, John Travolta. Where like if I look into their eyes, I truly don't see like I'm staring at somebody. Yeah. No shade towards them, but like I feel like I'm staring into like an empty vessel. You can throw um, shade at OJ. You can do a little shade at OJ if you <laughs> desire to. So. Tra- no, Travolta, no, no. we're working Travolta on a project for real. Uh, with Peace OJ. And love. <laughs> it's, a, it's a buddy comedy. We can't, <laughs> we can't talk um, about it. He like I. That's the thing. So there's something about Travolta now. Yeah, that it's like in certain like you just see him in an interview or even in his, the OJ show he was in, and it just looks like there's. He's doing a fine job acting, but there's nothing going on back there behind those eyes. It's the the old Scientology stare. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just Jackson and I watched uh, Gotti, uh, which he's the star of, and he's oh, wasn't, didn't like, I get like uh, terrible boss? reviews? Oh, oh I think one of like the worst. Zero so percent on Rotten Tomatoes. I never saw actually. it. It opens like with a monologue, and then you don't realize that he's like actually saying it in real time, and it pans to him under the Brooklyn Bridge. He's like, "This is my fucking city." <laughs> It's the best. <laughs> it's the best. Wait, Which, so it seems like narration, and then it pulls into him like at a bridge, like yeah, saying yeah. it in the exactly. moment. Oh my been... god! <laughs> and it's directed by E from Entourage. Like, Kevin no, Connelly, probably, you know. probably got the script that was like, yeah, we can make a gangster Scorsese pick, and it's the farthest thing from it. Oh, no shade man. at uh, E from Entourage. Or John Gotti. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God you got these prefaces, dude. Otherwise, yeah. they might be interpreted as shade. <laughs> they were uh, all listening it? and they were all going, hey. Oh, okay. Oh, no shade. Okay. Thanks, Thank God. God. Okay. Thank God. Wait, is, is Gotti in that area, though? Is that a fun one to watch with the boys because it's so bad? Or is it just like, oh, bad, bad? Please do. Please. No, no, it's, okay. it's so bad it's good. good in the best way. I love that. I think there was a controversy at the time when that movie came out that they were like faking reviews or something does that ring a bell at all no but i, I would don't believe know. it 100 percent. i honestly I'm, I'm confident that if i even google gaudy fake reviews that i'm gonna get uh a result for it because it was like it legitimately yeah mashable gaudy appears to be posting fake positive reviews on rotten tomatoes here's one from <laughs> cineblend and indiewire and what's trending and vox interesting because it it had a, a certified Whatever the opposite of fresh is on Rotten Tomatoes, it was a zero percent critic rating on, on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> you gotta love those movies where every critic is like, "I'm sorry, no." <laughs> like we can't, even, <laughs> yeah, I can't even find a little. Yeah, I remember um, what's it called? The show, The Equalizer, with Queen Latifah was like highly, highly advertised, and yeah. then the, it came out right after the Super Bowl. And all you could see were Twitter bots being like, um, can, can't spell action without Queen Latifah. And just like the most BS uh, 
bot like tweets about Was just clearly trying to boost the ratings of the Denzel movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I still haven't seen those. I heard decent things about equalizer i've never heard the films like, yeah i think so yeah. too but it was just the most well, clear i've ever it's seen true. it you can't spell action without queen latifah that full word <laughs> you really the can't word action at queen latifah still learning english action. yep you got it gus thanks go for it again try hurt. again at queen latifah <laughs> <laughs> that okay. hurts to say it slows my brain down you got one more question for us gus Got a little question over here. Alrighty. So at Lanky1414 says, if you were in a Groundhog Day scenario, how many days or years do you think it would take you to figure out how to steal the Mona Lisa from the Great First question. Oh, wow. That's a good day question. Day one. Jack, I just, Jack and I, I were literally just talking myself. about heart, heart Heist the other day. Good. <laughs> I think uh, I mean, two years. Two years. Two years? Two years? Two years? Yeah. Dude, I could do it in a year tight, Jackson. Easy. <laughs> I'm telling know, you this. I'm doing, it, I'm doing we'll it in lose. two months, and I'll tell you why. I'm not going to be scared uh, to I'll, – I'll take the pain of getting shot and everything and dying in that way, and I'm just going to go, like, way too hard in trying to steal it, so I find every single way that I could be stopped. Right, um, that's so a every smart day strategy. is a big learning experience. <laughs> See, I would, I would take the opposite approach, Eddie. I would basically go – I would befriend every security guard and become like best friends with them for years. This could take me five to ten years. I'll be well, best friends at their the wedding. First day every day, Mike. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah none but, of it carries over. But no, you, it carries over because they just there's a warmth inside that like they, <laughs> they, <laughs> they, so so you're showing up after a repeat day of like three years. You walk up and they just go, I feel like I've known you my whole life. I feel like, like I've known you for yeah, exactly. <laughs> why just, don't you why don't you take a take a hack at the painting <laughs> real quick? No, you, do the, you do the thing where you go up to them and you're like, How's Lisa? Oh, is uh is Jody in in, in uh is she have her pretty piano recital this year? And then he goes Wow, you know me better than I know myself. <laughs> yeah. so, Take this. The security Here, guard of the, the Mona Lisa's the wife Mona Lisa. name is Lisa. That's cool. That's um, ironic. I'm going to learn here because I'm assuming we're all meeting back up after our separate ones and trying to see who did it. I'm going to yep. trick you guys and I'm going to just learn to paint it myself and then I'll just oh. show you a fake one. Oh, um, that's yeah, a, if, actually a really good idea. Just get a yeah. fake commission. I if feel like it actually would be easier to try and get Cause like obviously the Mona Lisa has like a shit ton of skill, but to like replicate it where you guys wouldn't notice, I feel like would take me less time than trying to steal the painting myself. Mm -hmm. Right. If the end goal is to just uh, prove to us that you've stolen it, that's the much easier route. But if we're all playing by the rules here, we have to get the real one. Two one years. Give me two years. The real one. I I think. Oh, here's the thing. Are we also existing in in? That's what that would be cool as fuck if it was Groundhog Day, but all of us are experiencing Groundhog Day and separately trying to steal it. So right. like and- I I'd, I'd be there in like you know in a disguise, and then I just see Gus get like strangled, and I'm like, well, Gus fucked up today. I guess it's my shot now. Oh man, you that know that would be a move cool in that scenario. Uh, yeah. Is like you dress up, you become a cop, and I let you guys steal it, and right as you're about to exit, I'm like, eh, I caught you, and then I take it for myself because oh, nice. you there think you I'm a go. cop. But I you like the, become a cop in like- one day, Jackson. <laughs> I like the one guy in the group that uh, got the Groundhog Day, but also the 51st Dates uh, <laughs> syndrome, so he doesn't remember anything from the day before. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Everyone else constantly. is just moving forward, and he's just like, hey, guys, how are you? And we, we see them try the first thing every day, and we don't tell them <laughs> at all. We don't make the 51st Dates like VHS tape. We just let them keep fucking up the whole time. <laughs> No, we make the tape every day, but it's the evening of like a really important Survivor episode, so we keep accidentally <laughs> taping over like our recording every day. Here's just, here's my survival. plan for chaos. G- Gus is the fifty first dates one, right? He doesn't remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I make the fifty first dates video and tell Gus that he's missed out on this and that you three are all in love and that so it's catching him up like 50 first dates so then Gus is now distracting you guys by trying to to you know to what he thinks rejoin this very meaningful relationship with the two of you very meanwhile smart. I'm getting away with the Moni Lisi you know very smart the Moni Lisi Da Vinci oh, I'm, I'm going to fleecy remember that Da Vinci Da Vinci's <laughs> yeah. my favorite bro <laughs> 
<laughs> I fucking love Davinci. Oh man, Davinci's great. When do you guys want to like... start this whole Moan or Lisa Steel Fest thing? <laughs> <laughs> Moan or Moan. Lisa. <laughs> Moan or Lisa. <laughs> Moan or. Moan or. That's so, a good question. Blanky. What are, you, what are you fucking thinking, huh? What? What are you thinking, huh? You guys, if you're doing something physically, like we can't, it, what are you doing a physical bit, or are you just saying what are you thinking? I said, ah, what are you, what are you thinking? That's what I was just saying. And he flexed right. at the camera. I, I just, I feel like he's not giving us any context of what the <laughs> what are you thinking is. No. Well, I just I wonder it. what you guys were fucking thinking. I mean, that's pretty much what the podcast is. Jesus Christ. I'm what glad if you I, asked. I have, I have half a mind to goddamn just resign from the podcast and leave my home right now, Eddie. So I am going to say right now that Gus is trying to abruptly end the podcast. No, I I'm leading into here. it. We're done. Dude, you got to stop paying Tony off. We're hemorrhaging podcast money <laughs> by getting him <laughs> uh, Yeah, I pay Tony, and then I pay him off to end the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> do it do it on that line I said. 57 minutes in. Right there, Tony. And I, 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 I just, see the Mona Lisa there. I really <laughs> like that. <laughs>